So can everybody hear me? 희찬 씨 들을, 들리나요? 오케이, okay, good, thank you. 오케이, okay, so let's start today. Okay, so. What we're going to do today is to finish up this lambda calculus chapter by discussing so-called denotational semantics. I mean, that's the semantics, the type of semantics that we studied before. And, yeah, and then we're going to look at it for, for this language. And so here's a quick reminder about lambda calculus. So lambda calculus is a very simple programming language which is mainly capture function def definition and function application. So the syntax of the language is extremely simple. It consists of only one kind of uh, phrases called expressions. They are either variables or lambda abstraction, which is really correspond to function definition. And then application. And then we studied about, I mean, so we do the usual things for this language, which is like defining the set of three variables, the notion of substitution and so on. And then we brought dynamics because I mean, the reason we write this lambda calculus expressions is to express some changes or especially like a function evaluation mechanism. And then they, these dynamics or some oper they, this real meaning, operational meaning of these expressions are captured by three types of relations that we defined. One was called contraction. I said, this is a kind of more idealized version of the notion of computation which is much more aggressive than what's really happening in the real programming languages. And then we take its reflexive transitive closure or alpha equivalence closure, that's called reduction. Intuitively, contraction describe one-step computation, reduction describe multi-step computation. And then we picked up a particular restricted version of the reduction, and, and that's written as uh, in what we have wrote it as a normal. This is was a called normal order evaluation. And that describe a mechanism of evaluating lambda care closed lambda calculus expressions, where uh, under the lambda we don't do any evaluation at all. And whenever we see a function application, in other words, whenever we see beta with x, we do not evaluate an argument, we just pass the, the argument to the, to the procedure without evaluating the argument. So that was called normal order evaluation. Then we also thought about another evaluation called ego evaluation, where it's very similar to the normal order evaluation, except that whenever we see an argument function application, so lambda expression applied to some expression, 
we evaluate its arguments as much as possible. So this is called evaluation. And then final outcome of this normal order or ego evaluation, that they are called the canonical form. Sometimes they are called values in other literature. And, and then they, these are, in our particular context, there was always a lambda, lambda abstractions. So, in other words, expression of the form variables. But then for the contraction and reduction, if we contracted things as much as possible, we get something which is different from the canonical form, because in the canonical form, under the lambda, we don't do any evaluation, but in the, the contraction and reduction, we can evaluate everything. So in those cases, we obtain something called the beta normal form. So that's what we studied before. Cannot this normal order evaluation form the basis of language like Haskell, some function called mechanism of Scala and so on. Ego evaluation becomes the basis of the I mean, Pokemo, Scala, and uh, I mean, most of that, like uh, even the function evaluation mechanisms in Python, Java, they all follow this ego evaluation mechanism. Okay, so we're gonna now study the mathematical semantics of these lambda calculus expressions. And then math two, what we mean by this is we're gonna define some space called D. And then we will write uh, this double bracket for every expression in the lambda calculus. That, I mean, that's not, this is not exactly what's happening, but they roughly correspond to saying this expression E should be an element in this space E. So that's roughly what we're gonna do. I mean, that's precisely what we're gonna do. Expression E is a closed expression, but but otherwise, I mean, this is roughly the big picture that we're gonna do. So we define mathematical space and then we will map expressions in this language into mathematical space. And then the reason that we are doing it is to clarify what's really going on. At the same time, the semantics can be used to justify compile optimization, program logics, or many things that we do on this uh, programming language, this lambda calculus. So then I think that actually giving us denotational, non-trivial denotational semantics for the lambda calculus was an open problem in the 1960s. So I, I mentioned this multiple times, the 1960s. This was a very long-standing open problem and which was solved later by Dennis Scott, who invented the domain theory. So, So one way, one way to understand why this is a problematic, I mean, I keep, when I, whenever I mention some, essentially this problem, I said, oh, we, in order to solve this, we need something like space D, which is isomorphic to its own function space or something of this kind. And then I said, I mean, this kind of isomorphism cannot be solved in a set because of cardinality issue. But then, I mean, we can actually see the problem much more clearly here, okay? So what's the problem? So the, so to understand this issue, why this giving the notation of semantics is tricky, let's imagine the following scenario. So suppose we can, we, we are somehow managed to give a semantics of lambda calculus using some set S. So S is a set. Suppose we are giving the semantics of lambda calculus using some set S. 
But one interesting thing about lambda calculus is that for any expression in the lambda calculus can become a, I mean, yeah. So, no, I think let me phrase it in the right way. And I think this is not perhaps the right things that to say. So maybe a bit better way to see this. So in lambda calculus, the functions that we can define is going to be an expression. In other words, our space, this is, this is set S, which should accommodate all the expressions that we can define in the lambda calculus should contain its own function space because that's what we can do. We can define in the lambda in the lambda calculus using this lambda expression that I just pointed out above. So what that I mean what we, we're gonna make a bit nicer assumptions, which is I mean, corresponding things in over this set S is that set S should contain all its function space. This looks very weird, but this who knows, this kind of thing can happen. So we have a set S in order to give us semantics of lambda calculus using this set S, where every expression is interpreted as an element in the set S. So that's have to satisfy this property, which is it should contain its own function space. Why is that? That's because in the lambda calculus, we can write uh, expressions can become a lambda expression, which are just functions over I mean, over some expressions, okay? So this is what should be done in order to model lambda calculus. But if set S set by this property, okay, so this is what we should do. Then what we can do is we can, can think about what kind of S is possible. And it turns out the answer is that the only possible S which is set by the property that I wrote it as a star. Yeah, it's going to be either single, it's going to be a single thing set. Okay. Of course, empty set doesn't really work because if S is an empty set, actually, you may or may not agree with me, but there is a function that goes from empty set to the empty set that's called empty function. So empty set cannot contain the, I mean, empty set doesn't contain anything, but it should contain empty function, that's a contradiction. So S cannot be an empty set, but S can be a single thing set in some sense, okay? However, if we try to include more than a single thing set, more than one element in S, that's gonna cause a problem. So cardinality of S should be M is one. So this is pretty bad if, so this because if you give a denotation of semantics where our space just contain only one element, that means every expression will have the same meaning. So that's not what we want. We want to, the reason we write these expressions in lambda calculus to express variety of computation, not a single computation. So this, this means that we can't really use a set. So then the question is why this is the case. So, so why this is the case? And then the reason is it's because every function f on s has a fixed point. So one can show that if the set S contains more than one element, then you can't, I mean, there, are, there is some function which doesn't have a fixed point. So you, there always exists a function that doesn't have a fixed point. This type of things, every function has a fixed point happens only when this S has at most one element. Okay. So, so this is, that's the case and we can actually look at this. 
So you can ask, okay. So what, why this is the case? So to, to see this, let's do the proof, which is actually quite easy. And it's also quite related to so-called uh, y of y combinator in the lambda calculus, which we may or may not talk about. So let's we okay, suppose we our set our set as contains its own function space. Okay. Now also that f be a function from S to S. And we want to show, we want to say, show that this actually F is a fixed point, okay, how to do it. So we will define an operator uh, P that's, that's a function that take S and return S by case analysis, we say that if P of X, if X is an element of S is a function. That's possible. I mean, S is small X is an element of S, but it can be a function because of this relationship. So if it's a function, we apply X to itself because X is also an element of S, we can apply X to itself. And then F for their outcome, we apply function F. Otherwise, we just pick return some specific element x is zero. Simple, otherwise we can just return x. So and I'm gonna show that this P is a fixed point of F. And why is that? That's because if we because P is a function that goes from X, S to S. P itself, so P is a function that goes from S to S. And function from S to S, they are all included in S. So therefore P is an element of S. So we can apply P to itself. Now, by looking at the definition, if the argument is a function, we do the self-application and apply F there. So, we end up with we do the self-application and apply F. And now you can see that if you see the from the perspective of a function F, function F is applied to P applied to P, and its outcome is P applied to P. In other words, so P applied to P is a fixed point. So this shows that every if space function space is included in S, every function F has a fixed point. And that can only happen if my set S has at most one element. So, so that's the reasoning that we can complete. And that reasoning essentially shows that using set, we can't really give a reasonable semantics for uh, for the lambda calculus. So what should we do? So what's the solution? Solution is to use domain theory. and categorical fixed point theorem. So in the solution, I mean, in the textbook, it doesn't really say how the specific domain I'm gonna talk about now are constructed. But they can be constructed for certain cases, to two cases, it can be constructed using categorical fixed point theorem that we talked about. And the first case, one has to generalize our categorical fixed point theorem a little bit. Okay. So 
So here are three uh, domains, so which we're gonna use to give us semantics for lambda calculus under contraction, lambda calculus under normal order evaluation, and the lambda calculus under ego evaluation. So I will give you the domains and then maybe I will ask you to figure out which one you should pick for which. Okay. So then here's the first domain. First domain is, uh, is called, let's call it D1. Sometimes it's called D infinity. That's a domain which is isomorphic to its own function space. D1. But they are only con continuous functions. So and then where D1 is a domain. Containing more than one element. Okay. So if I mean, the, the reason I said so we, we need to generalize a little bit of categorical fixed point theorem and uh, this instantiation with the, 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 the category of, of embedding projection pairs that's covered in the lecture is because, I mean, if you just apply the theorem, you end up with a D1, which contains only one element, but there is some way to generalize this categorical fixed point theorem, where we will replace the initial objects by something a little bit, something containing two elements, domain, then all the rest will, I mean, you have to general, change the statement of theorem a little bit, but not modular the change of the statements, all the tools that we developed will work out. And so that will give us this domain, which is D1, which is contains more than one element, then, and it's isomorphic to uh, its own continuous function space. So that's a one domain. And then in this domain, we're gonna define something called V1 to be the same as D1, okay? So that's a one, one domain. So what this domain tells us, this domain tells us we have some space, which is isomorphic to its own function, continuous functions on it, okay? The space of continuous functions on it. And then the second option, so, so like, uh, before going to the second, so this one kind of related to the lambda calculus. In the lambda calculus, if you think about the, the syntax of lambda calculus, the key other operation that we did in, in the lambda calculus is an application. Okay. And this application tells us any expressions can be used as a function. Okay. So the lambda abstraction tells us any functions should be an should be an expression. Any expression, the third case said any expression should be applicable to another expression. So in other words, the, this lambda calculus uh, tells us actually, I mean, suggests that the isomorphism that's, that's going on here is say that any element in D1, if you follow one direction of the isomorphism, that means any element of D1 can be viewed as a function. If you follow the other part of isomorphism that goes from the function space to D1, it tells us any functions should be understood as a element over D1 should be an element of D1. Just like the, we, the lambda calculus expression, we have the second case is in the lambda abstraction, which is to define functions. That's like uh, this, this arrow that I just wrote there. And every expression, we have on the third case, which is an application case that suggests we can go to the opposite direction. So this isomorphism is closely related to what's really going on in the lambda calculus. But now I want to make you confuse a little bit so that you can think of it more. But there are just some other ways to make a similar kind of isomorphism. So this is an option two. So this option two goes like this. We said D2 is isomorphic to D2 continuous function space D2, but we lift it. 
okay, we add one extra element here. And then in this case, we define V2 to be just continuous function space. So what's the difference between one and two? I mean, if you ignore V1 and V2, the difference is that in one case, we said V1 is isomorphic to the functions, continuous function space. In the case of V2, we said that V2 is isomorphic to the, I mean, isomorphic to the continuous function space with one extra bottom element, okay? So, so that's an option too, that also kind of say what's really going on in the lambda calculus, but there are sort of difference. One, in the case of number one, smallest elements in D1, which is gonna be bottom, that's the same thing as the smallest element in this function space, which is mapping everything, all the arguments to the bottom. But in number two, smallest element in D2 is gonna be this bottom, that's different from the smallest function, which maps everything to the bottom. Okay. So it has a more fine-grained distinction about what smallest element should mean. In other words, this, this smallest element represents a non-termination. They have uh, some different mm -hmm. way of treating, formalizing this notion of non-termination. And by the way, I mean, this one, because the we want to define this way, I mean, can write it like V1, although it's obvious. And also write corresponding thing here. So V2, I um, think D2. So we need to synchronization. So if we do, um, it's a bit tricky, but we two is defined by D2 minus bottom. So I'm gonna define it a bit different way, but we is defined by we two bottom. So that it becomes like this. And the third option, D3, it's actually, it's, it's, in this case, we play a more important role. The, we follow the same recipe as what's going on in number two. So we said uh, D3 is, is defined by V3 lifted. But V3 is going to now satisfy isomorphism, which is Take uh, with three continuous functions over uh, with three bottom. Okay. So it will take uh, I mean this this type of relationship. Okay. So let's I mean this number three looks a bit weird, but if you want to have a better understanding, we can change this number. I mean this two a little bit. So it's equivalent three. D2 can be written like this. We said D2 is the same as V2 lifted. Because I mean V2 is defined by D2 minus V2. And then we can say we can replace this isomorphism in terms of V2. Say V2 is isomorphic to V2 lifted continuous function with two. So if you compare number two and three, the key difference lies in, so number two and three are pretty similar, except that in the V2, the, the isomorphism of V2, in one case, this we are taking the V2 lifted, maybe just, so in one case, we are using V2 lifted. In other case, we are just using V3, okay? So one add bottom, the other doesn't add bottom. Okay, what does it mean? That intuitively means that our function space, the, I mean, this V2 
is isomorphic to the continuous function space. In the case of V2, we are expecting to get bottom as an, one of the possible inputs. And bottom represents non-termination, so we are expecting non-terminating inputs. In the case of V3, we are not expecting non-terminating input at all. So all the inputs to the continuous functions is going to be terminating ones. Okay, so these are the three domains. And then in the number two and three, we can we can use the, the categorical fixed point theorem and domain theory, which is domain the category of domain of embedding projection pairs, which I covered very quickly, but which I mean with my lecture note explain what's really going on. And you can use it to show existence of this, this type of domain D2, I mean D2, and the, actually V2 is, uh, V2 is also domain, domain V2 as well. And then also everything in like a D3 and V3, we can use this category of fixed point theorem and this uh, domain, domain theory. For the number one, we have need to use something more general. The slight generalization or modification of categorical fixed point theorem, then you can show that it exists. So here's a question I want you to think about. So here's an exercise. So we're going to define the semantics of three language, I mean the same language on the three different evaluation, which means actually the three different languages. So we're gonna want to define semantics of lambda calculus. Lambda calculus. On the contractions or reduction relation and normal order evaluation are the, also the ego evaluation. So this is the number one, number two, and number three. So these are the three different languages, lambda calculus on the this, uh, reduction relation, normal order evaluation, ego evaluation. In each of these cases, we want to give us semantics, demarcation of semantics using either one or two or three, okay? So here is one question I want you to think about. So what you have to do is we have to kind of draw a one-to-one -one map between, so normal order and equal one side. And then we are, there is something called a P1, P1, P2, P2, and P3, P3. So try to draw a one to one map here. Okay. So if, for instance, you say this. Uh, Reduction will correspond to D2, V2. What does that mean is we're gonna use D2 as a space of our denotation of semantics, which I explained here. So we're gonna use D2 as a space. And then our expressions under that uh, evaluation is gonna satisfy, uh, it's gonna be interpreted as an element in this space, D2. Okay. So think about this. And then I just mention one more thing. The reason why this evaluation matter is because when we interpret the semantics of expression, we want to guarantee the following, okay? We want to say E and E prime have the same value if E gets contracted to E prime, okay? So these are the kind of property that we want to ensure for the first semantics. And we want something similar for the normal order and ego evaluation. And we want our equality to capture just this evaluation as precisely as possible. Okay. So that's what we want to capture. And D1, D2, D3, they are suitable for, I mean, for different things here. Okay. So 
So think about this. So I will give you five minutes. I mean, that, give, give me getting any answer is really easy. You just draw anything. But I want you to think about, okay, why certain mapping, draw some mapping and think about some justification of that mapping. So, I mean, Robert, I'm gonna answer a question to Hee Chan in Korean. I mean, so he asked the uh, uh, relationship between isomorphism and the lambda calculus. Uh, the isomorphism and the lambda calculus have a relation in the uh, 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 the lambda calculus is an expression, it's a like function application, it's expression, expression apply, lambda expression, and two other things. But it's all the expression and form. So, if you think about it, and if you think about it, and if you think about it, and if you think about it, lambda abstraction is always D1 and D1. So, all the things uh, expression it and uh, lambda expression it and lambda abstraction it and more than Hamsuduri, D1 and Pomi there than that. Blunt is archery, you have been there. Kudame, Otton expression it in Jigane, application of Sama Sutan, more than D1 in an element of the Hamsuri as a Rashi said in that. When you mean apply Hashi said in the grant is not there. As a abstraction, it gives them a Hams function space as a D1 or Gana mapping Junjaya de Go. 그 다음에 모든 expression을 다른 expression의 함수로 apply를 할수 있기 때문에 D1에 있는 expression, D1에 있는 element를 함수로 볼수 있는 것들이 또 존재해야 되고. 근데 1, 2, 3이 다 그런 거에 대해서 어떤 거는 직접적으로 표현하고 어떤 거는 좀 다를 수 있게 표현하고 막 그렇게 되는 거죠. 근데 그게 다 evaluation 아니면 contraction을 쓰는 어떤 걸 쓰냐에 따라 달려있기 때문에 또 질문이 나온 거. Okay, so let me give you an answer here. The answer is actually, so the mapping is that 
this contraction or reduction correspond to uh, this D1, V1. Normal order evaluation correspond to D2, V2. Eager evaluation correspond to D3, V3. So let me just give you uh, the intuitive idea about why that is the case. So if you think about the key distinction, so, so why this answer? So key distinction between D1 versus D2 and D3, it is about how to treat bottom. Okay. In the D1, I mean, by this isomorphism, smallest elements, bottom is D1, so smallest elements, it is essentially the same by this isomorphism. as a function. So I'm gonna uh, using lambda here makes it's a function that takes elements in D1, D and D1, and return bottom. Okay. Think about this function that takes an element D, D, return bottom. They are the same thing via this isomorphism. So this isomorphism map is a bottom in D1 to the function that returns the bottom and vice versa, okay. And, but in the D2 and D3, they are different. So if you look at the D2 and D3, I mean, in both case, I mean, for D2 is a lifted V2, and V3 is a lifted V3. And then V2, are V2 and V3 are the ones that contains all the functions. So the smallest function that return only bottom, that is different from this bottom element of D2. Okay. So this, the bottom element of D2 and D3, they are different from a function that returns a bottom. Okay, why this is important? Now what this say, is that now if you look at this, this type of lambda calculus expression, okay. so now if you consider lambda x dot lambda y dot y y lambda y dot So for this lambda calculus expression, in under the contraction, okay, this expression will go on forever because if you contract the body of this lambda abstraction, it will get it get contracted to itself. So if you contract it again, it, it becomes itself again. So this one contraction will will never make this into a beta normal form. It will continue and go on forever. On the other hand. On the normal order evaluation and the eager evaluation, I mean, this term will just terminate immediately because it's a canonical form. It doesn't have, beta normal form. But it is in canonical form. So if under the evaluation of uh, uh, under eager, eager evaluation or normal order evaluation, this lambda calculus term will terminate it immediately because it's the canonical form. And then that will give an answer. So, so it's not this under normal order and eager evaluation, this term is not going to lead non-terminating computation. So just, I mean, if you compare this with just something like this, This term below will not, I mean, will lead to non termination under both normal order evaluation 
and eagle evaluation, and as well as in reduction. I mean, it will go on forever. So there is a possibility of non-termination on the old evaluation or reduction strategies. But if you look at the above, this above one terminates only on the, I mean, terminates the each evaluation terminates on the normal order EVA evaluations, but it doesn't terminate on the uh, normal order and you know, on the reduction. Okay. So what does that suggest? That suggests that if you look at the inside of this lambda, what this term inside the lambda represents a non-terminating computation, but itself is not going to be a non-terminating computation on the ego and normal evaluation. In other words, I mean this the lambda roughly corresponds to a mapping it maps D to bottom, but on the D to this normal order and ego, it should be different from bottom. It should not be a non-terminating computation. Ego or normal order evaluation. Okay. On the other hand, under the, the usual reduction, this guy, the, the one in the, the entire term here, it should be, I mean, this, this should rep represent the same as, something same as non-termination because, I mean, it doesn't have a bit of a So that suggests that the, the, the key difference between D1 versus D2 and D3 is how to treat I mean, the, how to treat non-termination under the lambda in D1, that's regarded as non-termination for entire thing. D2 and D3, that's it's treated as something different from uh, uh, something different from non-termination of the entire thing. That's more in line with what's really going on under, but under this ego and normal order evaluation. So that's why D1 gets mapped to the normal order D1 gets mapped to the reduction. D2 and D3 will get mapped to the normal order and EVA evaluations. So now the, the next question is, okay, so that's informal answer for the first. Then the next question is that, so why D2 is a for normal? And D3 is for the EVA evaluation. So that's the next question we can ask. And then now look at uh, the, the difference, to try to compare the difference between D2 and D3. Now, if you look at D2 and D3, if you look at, uh, I mean, this figure that I just wrote here. So I mean, this definition here and And this definition here. Okay. If you look at this definition, I mean the characterization of D2 that I just highlighted, also characterization of D, uh, D3 and D3. And that the only difference between these two is about the argument position of the isomorphism for the for V. Okay. V2 case arguments is V2 bottom, that, that's the same as D2. And in the V3 case, the arguments at argument position, what we can have is the V3. So it's not V3 bottom. So what, what does that tell us? That tell us in the case of V2, is the functions we are thinking about, well, functions in this in the isomorphism for V2 is prepared to take non-terminating arguments. Okay. In the case of V3, Functions we are thinking about is only prepared for the terminating arguments. Now, if you look at so terminating arguments, that's for number three, not possibly non-terminating argument, that's for number two. Now, if you look at this uh, normal order evaluation and EVA evaluation, now consider the lambda calculus form, which Take x and just return, ignore it. And then suppose that we are passing this argument, okay, lambda z. So same argument that we are keep using it. Okay. 
under the normal order evaluation, and this entire argument without being evaluated, it's going to be passed directly to this function. So that's going to be the normal order evaluation. And but under the eager evaluation, we will get stuck here. So with this one going forever. Under the ego evaluation. So, because the ego evaluation always evaluate the argument, right, the arguments first, the arguments before doing the function application. Normal order doesn't evaluate the arguments and just go, go ahead and then apply the function. So, because the ego evaluation evaluates these arguments before function application, by the time we pass argument to the function on the ego evaluation, it's going to be always a value. It's going to be, it will never be a non-terminating thing. I mean, if it's non-terminating, we are already I mean, finished. I mean, we are already, we already have a problem. I mean, we, we will never reach this function application phase. So, so the argument X on the normal order, it can potentially be bound to non-terminating computation. But arguments on the, the ego evaluation, it will always bound to terminating computation, or it will always going to be sometimes we, we call it value or canonical form. So arguments on the ego evaluation is much nicer in the sense because it's always it can always be it, it, will, it will always be a uh, something that there's the, the, some something called uh, canonical value. It will never be a non-terminating computation. So this difference appears in the definition of this domain. So in the above case, I mean, you can see that argument can be valued together with the possibility of non-termination. Below case, it will always going to be a value. So you can see that the one below, it really captured the, uh, the, the aspect of ego evaluation, which is by the time we pass some arguments to a function, the past thing is always going to be a canonical form. So that's why this is related to ego evaluation. And this one is evaluated related to the normal order evaluation. Okay. So just to sum up, the, the, this arrow star is related to D1, V1 and others, uh, and then the reason is that this uh, D1, we don't distinguish function that return bottom and bottom, okay? And that is uh, related to the idea of, I mean, the, the fact that under the reductions, the under lambda, we, we do some computation. The, the body of the lambda get evaluated. So, so that's what's happening there. For D2, for about D2 and D3, it distinguish function returning bottom and the bottom. And that related to, we are not evaluating anything on the lambda. And then the difference between D2 and D3, they all boils down to what kind of things can be passed as a function arguments. I mean, D2 say non-terminating computation can be passed. D3 said only the that only canonical form can be passed, and they are really what's really happening under the normal order evaluation and ego evaluation. So that's why we have this relationship. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is that we will use these domains to to define the demarcation of semantics. So we will work out the denotation of semantics. Okay, so here's a first case. We are thinking about lambda calculus on the reduction, 
on the contraction. So we are using, okay, so lambda calculus. The contraction or reduction. We are talking about the same thing. And then we, so here we are using the D1. So D1, we write it like this. We, there is an isomorphism. D1 is a more con continuous function space. And then we we're gonna do the interpretation. But because, so we'll have an interpretation function, this will take expression. And then we will give a value in D1, but it's not going to give a value in D1 immediately. It will take something called the environment. That's because our expression may contain free variables, so that this environment is a provide a meaning for the free variable. So this is a continuous function. And then environment consists of all the functions from variable to D1. Okay. And so here the so this is uh, just all the functions from variable to D1, and then they are ordered by pointwise, and they will form a domain, and that's what we're gonna use in, in the environment. And environment, elements of the environment, we're gonna put eta. So eta provides a meaning for the free variables. And when we are given the meaning for the free variable, we can translate the expressions into an element in D1. So I will show this, how this works. And then I will ask you to complete similar semantics for the lambda calculus on the normal order evaluation and lambda calculus on the eva evaluation. Okay. So how we do it, the definition is the syntax directed. So we consider a variable case. And then we consider lambda abstraction case. And we also consider application case. And each of the case we take, so we have we put expression arguments, and then now we also provide environment arguments. So environment argument is eta. So we are given eta everywhere. And then we have to provide something in D1. Okay. So this one should be in D1, also in D1, also in D1. Okay. How we do it? So the first case, we have to give a meaning of free variable x and eta environment is the one which is toward the meaning for all the free variables. So we just look up, apply eta to x. So eta is a mapping from variable to d1, which you can think of it like a lookup table. So we do the lookup table and look at the meaning of x that will give us the, the meaning for the variable x. And in fact, this is, has the right form because eta of x is gonna be an element of d1. Okay. Now, for let's look at this application first. Now, we, what we can do is we inductively interpret d1 and inductively interpret d2. And intuitively, what we have to do is we just apply. Okay. But this doesn't work because e1, uh, e1 eta, this is an element of D1. This is also an element of D1. So we can't really apply the element of D1 to D1. I mean, we need functions on D1. So what should we do? In this case, we use an isomorphism, one part of isomorphism, which is the B, that converts every D1 into a function. So we apply this B, that will convert D1 into a function, so that we can apply this function to the e, the e2 of eta. And for abstractions, what we can do is that we define, I mean, here I'm using lambda to mean a function, okay? Not the lambda expression in the, in the lambda calculus. We, we take 
a value in e one, and then we return an element in d one by evaluating e, well, interpreting e on the eta where variable x is now bound to be. So this whole thing is going to be a function that take e one and return something in d one. Okay. That's not an element in d one. So we have to convert it to this element. So we apply sign. Okay. So that, that's the semantics. Of course, we have to check. I mean, the semantics needs all the, it's well defined. There are many conditions like continuity condition and so on. So these conditions need to be checked, but you can check this. I mean, this property is true. And you can see that like the semantics almost follows by the type, by your intuition about what's going on together with all these basic components that already exist for D1. Now here's an exercise I want you to solve. So now we define the semantics of lambda calculus on the normal order evaluation. Also lambda calculus on the ego evaluation. So I will give you, I mean, provide the shape of this interpretation. So the shape looks like this. In this case, we have uh, in D1 is same as you know, D2. V2 lifted. And then for V2, we have an isomorphism. Uh, it goes from um, V2 lifted to so that's what's happening here. And then for the lambda calculus on the uh, ego evaluations, we have a D3, so the V3 lifted, and then V3. So Murphy to the arrow okay. and then the interpretation function here have this form. It takes expression and then it takes an environment and continuous function to Two. But one, there's one important thing bit. Here's the very well. Here, environment is the same as what you see above there. So, variable to B2. And so, let's, yeah, let's try to write everything in terms of, let's write it D2. But in that case below, it's more interesting. So it's expression and environments three. But here, environment is from variable to values. So this the reason we have a difference between here one case we have a D2, D2 is a V2 bottom, so the bottom can be there. The, the ego evaluation case, we only have a V3, the so bottom cannot be there. And the reason is exactly the same as what I explained before. Whenever we these three variables are only but get bounded by function application mechanism, whenever three variables get bounded, they always get bounded to the, to the canonical form. So another, some intuitions that I have forgot to tell you is that V2, V2 is a domain for everything, for all expressions. And V2 is a domain for canonical forms. So some people call it V2 is a domain for values and D3 
two is a domain for the for, for, for all the expressions. The same data for all expressions. And V3 for canonical forms. And later we're gonna use this general principle to give an interpretation of much more complicated language. So I will give you five minutes so that you can complete now the semantics for in, in both cases. So what you have to do is that you have to define this interpretation function. So let's call it like N and E. So you have to say what is X and eta should be uh, lambda X E and eta E1, E2, and E3. We have to define this case and similarly to define. So what, the, these things should capture notion of normal order evaluation and ego evaluation. Oh. Mm, something strange. What is this? Um, so sorry about this. Mm. Uh, yeah, please ignore this, the, the PDF. I don't know how to get rid of this. So, so the last case is for application. So try to finish this definition. Okay, so the, the first case is, in both cases, it's not very difficult. If you look at this, we have I mean, the very value of variable x, you just look it up. So the environment will map variable to 
elements in, in D2. Sometimes some people call elements in D2 as semantic computation, elements in V2 as the values. Okay. So they said D2 is a domain for computation, V2 is a domain for values. So it returned eta of x, which is a computation bound to x. And then for the lambda case, we form a function which take elements in D2. So which is the same as V2 bottom. And then we interpret expression E inductively under extended environments where X is now bound to D. And so this is a mapping that goes from D2 to D2, which is really a map, and this is the same as D2 and D2. So we can use the one of part of the isomorphism to map it to V2 psi. And then we implicitly embed this element V2 in D2 because D2 consists of elements in V2 as well as bottom. So we just include there. So this also indicates that whenever we write lambda expression, we have a value. In other words, we have a canonical form that exactly matches with our notion of canonical form, which is a lambda expression there. So in the bottom case, here's what we have to do. We need a bit more complicated case analysis. So if E1, so we want to convert E1 to a function, but to convert E1 to a functions, we are in, we, we have a one thing to check. E1 may be equal to bottom. So because E1 is an element of E2, E1 may be equal to bottom. If it's a bottom, we cannot convert it to a function. So, I mean, that means we have an operator Whenever we try, we, when we try to evaluate the operator, we, we go into non, we go into infinity. So then the entire thing should be an, should, should be a bottom. So E1 is e under eta is equal to bottom. In that case, the entire thing is equal to bottom. Okay. Otherwise, that means E1 Eta is not bottom, so it's an element in V2. So in that case, we can map it to a function by using V. And then we can apply to an argument directly. So note that we are not really doing similar kind of check for the arguments. That's because in the core by, you know, in the normal order evaluation, we are not evaluating the argument, we just pass arguments directly. And this has to be changed in the ego evaluation because we're gonna do the evaluation. So in the, so let's look at the other side. The variable case is easy, which is the same thing as theta of x. And then the lambda expression case, we define a function now, data, what we are taking as a function argument is not an element in, in D, okay, D3. It should be an element in, in V3, which is, it should not be a bottom. So we will write it like a V, just say it's an element in V3. And then we're gonna do the evaluate, uh, interpret body of the function on the, not N, so interpreted as this under the environments it's where variable x is now bound to v. Now one thing I want you to notice is, I mean, if you look at the definition of environments here, the environment to say every variable will get mapped to value. And that's, that's okay here because we are given value so we can bound it to, to, to X, not causing any problem at all. So, so we get uh, so mapping like this. So that's going to be a map from 
v3 to v3 bottom and we map it to the v3 using psi, one part of the isomorphism that's going to be included in v3. Okay. Now, function application, we, so we can return, we will go into the infinite loops. In this case, when one of the two, in the two cases, if the operator go into infinite loops, we go into the infinite loop, or operand E2 also go to the infinite loop, or E2 go to infinite loops, then we also go to infinite loop. So we have a bottom, which represents infinite loop, non-termination. If E1 E is equal to bottom, so oper evaluation of just to operate with, to operation to get up what operator we are talking about, that goes infinite loops, then we go into infinite loop. Or evaluation of the arguments go into infinite loops, then we go to the infinite loops. So you see the difference here. I mean, this part was absent here. It doesn't exist in the normal, uh, normal order evaluation. Otherwise, which means that operator is a value as well as operand is a value. That's an otherwise case. So neither of them is equal to bottom. In that case, both of them live in V3. So we can uh, convert E1 eta as a function. And then because E, E2 is also lives in V3, we can apply to the to this. Okay, and do it like this. Um, just give me like one minute, then I will finish. So this is a semantics, and then the, the next question is okay, how can you justify this semantics is okay? And one sim simple uh, some justification. This is not the full justification, but some part of the justification is that one thing you can show is if E1 gets reduced to E2, then you can prove E1 and E2 have the same meaning. That's what we are expecting because we expect this uh, reduction relations to preserve the meaning. Also, if E1 normal E2, that implies E1n, E2n. And similar things is also true for the ego evaluation case. One, two. This is not the full justification of this denotation of semantics, but it give a some sense of kind of base, basic checks. I mean, it, it showed that basic checks pass. Okay, so that's it for today and we will move on to the next chapter from, from the next week. Okay, thank you all for attending the lecture. I'm gonna be here about five minutes. If you have any questions, you can ask me.